Good morning, Glenmar. Good morning. Welcome to Glenmar United Methodist Church, where our mission is praising God, growing disciples, and serving the world. Welcome to folks in the house. Welcome to folks online. Um, wherever you're joining us today, we're so glad that you're with us, and we believe that it's no accident that you have um, uh, joined us on this beautiful fall morning, uh, that you have come, that we believe that God has a message for you and a plan for your life and loves you very much. And so uh, uh, we welcome you to this place. We urge you to uh, check in if you're joining us online. And if you're here in the house, we have... Um, QR codes that you can point your phone at, and your pastor is telling you to use your phone, so take the opportunity. We have old school ways to check in with little cards where you can let us know, um, but however you do it, we're so glad that you're uh, here today. Um, as I was driving in to church today, I was praying about um, this God that pours out God's Spirit um, upon us in blessings and presence and comfort and healing. And as I'm driving, the morning sun is pouring into my windshield and onto my face as if God knows that I need that extra reminder sometimes. So I'm grateful for all these blessings and all the ways that God's love is poured out and poured into and poured through you at Glenmar Church and this church family. Um, uh, Journey to Bethlehem is just about to go live for people to join us. And so on Tuesday, um, we will have the chance to pour out this gift upon our community again this year as people on Tuesday will be able to sign up to come and join us. So that's just one example of the ways that God pours God's grace upon us and we know if we're blessed, it's to be a blessing to others. So uh, I just want to welcome you to worship today. And I know that you're in for a blessing. Good morning. The frost is on the pumpkin this morning, for sure. <laughs> to quote James Whitcomb Riley, which is a wonderful poem you should look up when you go home. Uh, uh, please stand and join me for the call to worship. And remain standing after for the hymn, too. All that I am and all that I have, whatever gifts I received, I cannot brag. They are God's grace poured to me. God's lo God loves me so much so I can be free. God's amazing love pours grace and mercy. God wants us to walk in love generously God works in us, through us, and with us. Even if we can't understand, we must trust.
needed. I wish my eyes were good enough to be able to read the screen back there to sing along. <laughs> but um, please join me in an attitude of prayer. Almighty God, we praise you for all that you are all that you have done, are doing now, and will do. Gracious God, you are a God of compassion and love. Time after time, we have experienced your care and provision. Time after time, you have answered our prayers and met our needs, often in ways we could never have dreamed possible. We praise you for your faithful love toward us. Because we know your love, we come to you with confidence offering our prayers for the world that you love. We see so much pain and suffering, so much anger, frustration, and despair. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the needs around us. But we continue to bring our prayers to you in faith because we know that nothing is impossible with you. You are the God who rained down bread from heaven and made water flow from a rock in the desert the God who resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead and who brings new life and hope to all who believe. For you, all things are possible. Hear our prayers. We pray for those who live with serious illness and those with chronic pain, those without access to proper medical care, and those for whom treatment is no longer an option. Because nothing is impossible for you, O oh God, we lift up those in our beloved community in need of your healing. We lift up Bill Westervelt and Al Meinart who are undergoing cancer treatment. And we lift up Diane Keyes who is recovering from surgery. Steve Lakaitis and Willa Brooks, God, you know their needs, you see them. Marie Moineau, we pray that you will heal her back pain, Lord. We pray for Celine that you will heal her eyes and for she's Sophie's sister. Lord. And we pray for Suella Clevenel. We pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones. We lift up Robin Green on the loss of her mother. We pray for the people of Ukraine and Lord help us to be diligent in our prayer, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week. We pray for peace for those people and for other people in war-torn areas. We pray for racial justice and reconciliation, for victims of gun violence and all other sorts of violence, and for the pe people who love them. We pray for our children, and teachers and administrators of our schools. We pray for your protection over them, Lord. Please provide for them, protect them, and guide them. We pray for all those in need of healing and hope. We pray for missionaries and all who serve in mission and for our service men and women around the world. And Lord, I lift up a prayer for the Navy hospital ship Comfort, which is even now sailing to Central America and uh, Haiti to treat people there so much in need of care. And I pray for all our local, national, and international leaders that they will be guided by you, Lord, and that your will will be done through them and in them. In your abundant love, hear our prayers, O God. Merciful God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to show us a different way to live, the way of deep humility and obedience. You've called us to love one another and to work together with one heart and mind, balancing our needs with the needs of those around us. Give us the courage to follow you in all that we do. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, no, the anthem is next. Yay. <laughs>
That was beautiful, children. Thank you so much. Today's New Testament reading is from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, and it's Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as we continue our time of worship and as we uh, offer our hearts up in preparation for the word that, we'll, that we will receive, let's continue in a time of confession. And you will have words and your words will be, Kyrie, Lord have mercy. And so that you know, Kyrie means Lord. So essentially you will say, Lord, Lord have mercy. Let us confess the excuses we have made for not living in the reality of the kingdom of God. For our blindness to the needs of others. And our preoccupation with our own agenda. Kyrie, Lord have mercy. for our failure to pay attention to the still, small voice in our lives. For our surrender to fear and self-protection. Kyrie, Kyrie, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For harsh words spoken to our friends. And love withheld from our enemy. Kari, Lord, Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. For seeking success rather than faithfulness. 
for praying without acting. Kyrie, Kyrie Lord, Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. For our life choices this week that have not contributed to greater love and justice in the world. Kyrie, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. O oh Lord, who pours your spirit into us, you are our strength and our might. You are our hope and salvation. Listen to what God says. I have taken away the judgment against you. You are forgiven. You are loved. With joy, we will draw water from the well of salvation. As we have poured out our hearts and emptied all of the things that we carried with us in this place. Remember the word that we are forgiven. We are loved. And now I invite you into a moment of meditation. Gracious God, for the gift of your Holy Spirit, we give you thanks and praise for your grace outpoured, for your word that goes forth from your mouth, and like the rain that waters the earth, pours out and does not return to you until it has accomplished the thing that you have sent it to do. God, we are grateful. And so, Lord, we are open to receive the gift of your Spirit to hear with joy what you are saying to us today. God, for your grace, for your mercy, for your provision, we give you thanks and praise this day. In the name of Jesus, our judge and our hope, amen. amen. You may recall uh, two weeks ago now, we had talked about the time that the Apostle Paul wrote that we are like clay jars holding a treasure that has been poured into us. We're vessels that hold the treasure of God's love and mercy, the good news of Jesus Christ. We're not empty cups. The love of Christ has been poured out into the world and into our hearts. And because we have been poured into, that is how we can then do good works for others. As a response to the love of God, that God our Father has poured into us. It's one of the reasons that Paul can say, 
when we do not know how to pray as we ought, the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. When we are dry and parched, Christ comes to us as living water pouring into us. We know something about pouring into in our love for one another as well. Pouring when it comes to God, our divine parent, God is the pourer and we are the poorie. God pouring out the Spirit in creation. God pouring out God's Spirit into Jesus, the Son, the Word made flesh. Jesus is how God chose to reveal what God is like to the world. How God came in fullness to the world was in Jesus Christ, taking on flesh and dwelling among us, pouring out, pouring into. And how does this Jesus act? He pours out as well. We see this from Philippians 2, it contains an ancient hymn of the early church that often is called the kenosis hymn. Kenosis, meaning self-emptying, pouring out. Jesus, who had every reason to exalt himself, we read, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself poured out right emptied himself taking the form of a slave assuming human likeness and being found in appearance as a human he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross and in his death on the cross we have an outpouring too don't we an outpouring of God's love and forgiveness and mercy This is who God is and how God acts. God's essential character is self-emptying love. And if we could end this sermon right here, I would be really happy. Because I love the idea that God pours into us all the time. How God reaches out for me over and over, reaches down, uh, loves me back to life over and over and over, pouring out to pour in mercy, hope, and love. That part's great. The problem is it doesn't stop there. All this business about who Jesus is and what he is like affects how I am supposed to act and how I'm supposed to be in the world. I wish I were just called to be grateful to Jesus, but it turns out I'm called to follow him, and that's harder. We together proclaim that we are the church. We proclaim that we are the body of Christ. So we're bound together by things stronger than just um, agreement or similarity. We're not like a political party, which is probably bound together by common commitments to things like tax policy or immigration policy or human rights. That's not what the church is. We're the body of Christ. We're not a book club bound together by our love of literature or mysteries. We're not bound together by our politics or our race or our gender or our uniformity about anything that the world values. We're bound together because Jesus makes it so. We're bound together because Jesus binds us together. We're called to put up with each other and indeed to love one another by having the same mind as the mind of Christ who emptied himself. And that worries me. 
Because that means the church demands more of us than agreeing with each other. When we are baptized, we belong to God. It is no longer an optional arrangement. And when we're baptized, we belong to each other. Eyes and ears, hands and feet, we are together the body of Christ. It would be great if the church was not that. If we could be just another club to belong to, where like-minded individuals come together to do something nice for society. Like um, how the PTA raises money for new school books, or how the ASPCA cares about our animals. If we were like that, then if there was a disagreement, it's not like you have to be too hurt. It's not like your family or anything. If you get mad, you can just leave. But if the church is the body of Christ, it means we are called to something bigger than agreement. We're called to self-emptying love. Humility, putting the interests of others over our own interests, putting the interests of the whole body of Christ, the church, over any one part of the body of Christ, any one ministry. We are called not to uniformity. We're not all a bunch of ears listening around we're not called to uniformity where's the fun in that you can be uniform if you're small enough you can have a church of one two okay one you can have a church of one and you can have uniformity we're called to something bigger and better we're called to unity unity i've been in so many churches where they have had so many fights okay not this one y'all never fight about anything but other churches, you would be amazed at what they argued about. I've had people stand up in the middle of meetings and storm out. I've had people fight over things like um, how a hymn was played or the color of the carpet or where we put the chairs or how everything. Just, you would be amazed. We're called to bear with one another in love, to be humble and to be the body of Christ together. And it wasn't in all these arguments in other churches that I've been a part of before I was a minister. Um, the arguing did not really surprise me. It should have. What surprised me was very often there would be somebody in the room who would say, this is, this is my preference, but I love the church more than my preference. That got my attention. I had somebody in the middle of some gigantic church fight that was a choir member. And she said, uh, the only choir member who ever disagreed about anything. And, um, <laughs> and in the midst of this big fight, she said, uh, I, I, it was such a big fight. And I was like, they're all going to leave. That's it. We're going to have to shut the church down. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And this saint of the church said, oh, Mandy. You know, I was like... I was clearly so young and inexperienced. That was how she communicated. Like, oh, this poor girl. You know what I mean? She's like, it will take more than just this to break the bond of love with my church. This is my church. I love them forever. I, can't, I wouldn't go anywhere just like I wouldn't cut off my own hand. I'm not going anywhere. That got my attention called to bear with one another in love, to be humble, to be the body of Christ together. My illustration for this, I've shared with you before, but just in case you missed it, um, when my husband and I were dating, um, he took out his wallet for something. And I noticed he had a little piece of paper in there. And I'm really glad it wasn't another girl's phone number or anything like that. <laughs> I looked at it and it said, I'm third. Uh, and Eric was all of, um, were you like 20 years old, carrying a thing, I'm third in my wallet. And I said, honey, what's this? Uh, you're third. And he said, oh, yeah, that's from my high school youth group. 
it may have even been confirmation class, but I could just be straight up making it up now. But it was, it was your, your youth group. It was a youth group exercise where they learned God is first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the next greatest is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. God, neighbor, then me. I'm third. Eric was learning, thanks be to the adults that poured into you, what it was to be a Christian. Jesus reminds us, doesn't he, that true greatness looks like service. When he was asked, um, uh, who is the greatest? How can we be great? Jesus said, if you would be great, be a servant. If you would be the greatest, be a servant to all. So this church thing is not just about believing with our heads about who Jesus is, but having the mind of Jesus, having the heart of Jesus, being the body of Christ in the world, having his mind, having his heart, and if you would outdo one another, as Paul writes in another place, outdo one another in showing love. Compete in caring for one another more. Elizabeth Johnson says, in encouraging the community to be of one mind, it can't be that Paul thought there would be no difference of opinion within the community. He knows what congregations are like. That, that can't be true. Rather, she says, he implores them to be united in the spirit of love and concern for one another and the body of Christ as a whole. This, become clearer, this becomes clearer when he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. I'm third. And he further exhorts them, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Paul envisions the life of the community being formed by the mind of Christ. By a spirit of humility and loving service to one another, rather than competition and grasping for power and control. So this is super hard, so how can we do it? Well, we can do it by the power of the Holy Spirit that brings us together in the first place. Because we have been poured into, we have within us the assurance of God's love. That God is present with us every day, everywhere. A rainbow is a promise, as the kids ministered to us. We have been poured into and equipped for every good work. All of us given gifts for ministry that are all needed for the body of Christ to work as it should. We are ears and eyes and feet and hands for the body of Christ. And when this works well, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. God pours out God's Spirit, giving these gifts. God pours out God's Spirit, and our young ones see visions, and our old ones dream dreams, as on the day of Pentecost. God pours out God's Spirit, and we have journey to Bethlehem, even with Margaret Lang on the rim of the Grand Canyon looking at beautiful vistas. God pours out God's Spirit and we can hear one another even when we are speaking different languages. Oh, come on, church. We can hear one another even when we're speaking different languages. And I don't mean I'm speaking French and you're speaking Spanish. It means that by the power of the Holy Spirit, if we can come into a, a space with the heart and mind of Christ as much as we can possibly do, we can hear one another in our disagreements. We can see and hear Jesus in each other. And because the Spirit is poured into us, we now have something to pour out to others when we help each other and listen to each other and assume the best in one another. Will Williman says doing this 
is a way to show the world another way to live. He says, it's the claim of the Christian faith that Jesus Christ makes possible that which the world considers impossible. That we are called not only to believe in him, but also to follow him and to emulate him. To engage in the same moves in our lives that characterize his. It's the claim of our faith that Christ not only commands us to live together and minister together as one, but Christ also enables us to do the things he's commanding us to do. This Holy Spirit heals our wounds. It bridges our boundaries and it closes our gaps. And he says, your church and mine is called to be a showcase for what God can do. A showcase. In the early church, the pagan world looked at the early church and they marveled that there was this group of people that was not organized the way the rest of the world is organized. The rest of the world was organized on the basis of family, gender, class, and money. The surrounding culture looked at the church and they didn't say, um, look what you know fancy buildings they have or look at their tax exempt status. None of that. They, 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 they looked at the church and they said, Look how they love one another. Mind blown. That should still be what the world sees when it looks at the church. And I believe it is what the world sees when they look at Glenmar. I see it every day. Look how they love one another. Earlier in the sermon I said, uh, if you want to know what God is like, you should look at Jesus and the characteristic of God looks like self-emptying love. It also looks like God is in the business of bringing people together in his name. It's what Jesus did. And so we see that's our assignment too. To bring people together. Divided by everything that can possibly divide us, right? I don't think we could agree on anything. called together to do something different. Called together by something more significant than our sameness. Sameness is not a Christian value. Unity is. We come from all our different places, all our different backgrounds, and we are committed to walking together in the same direction Toward Jesus, who has walked toward us. I'm walking slower than anybody. I don't walk fast. Y'all are very patient with me. I know it feels particularly difficult to do this now, in this place and time, when we seem so polarized as a society. I get it. It's almost election time. It's early voting. Vote early, vote often, vote. Um... <clears throat> But it, it, it's hard to do this when we seem so separated, when differences seem to lead the way and lead not just to separation, but differences seem to lead to hate and seem to lead to violence. And these trends come from a lot of places, and you don't pay me to be your sociologist for you. I think one of the things, though, that makes it worse is when you have this device in your hand, um like the ad people and the Facebook wizards and whatever, they know what you're clicking like on, and so they give you more of that. It's like uh, these rats that press the button and they get a shot of heroin or something. And what me, it, that, that reinforces um, that we're all in these little silos, and um, it reinforces the differences. It makes us into us and them. The media and other places are incentivized to maximize polarization because if there's conflict and drama, then that leads to ratings and gets attention. And that's as much as I know about that. And I could be wrong. I'm wrong a lot. Don't be mad. I will say the church is one of the few places left 
where people are called to be bound together and love one another without choosing. You don't get to choose. You come, you join, you're one of us. There's a seat at the table. Everybody's in. The caveat is you don't get to kick other people out. You don't get to choose. But it's a gift because we can show the world what Jesus can do and the difference Jesus can make. Jesus is the tie that binds. The one who pours into us and calls us to pour into others. The pouring in part, that's a blessing. But we know at Glenmar, if we're blessed, it's not as a reward for past service, right? If we're blessed, it's to be a blessing to others. If we have been poured into, we're called to pour into others. It means church is not just another thing that we do. Church is who we are. Prayer is who we are, not just another thing we choose to do. Worship is who we are, not just another thing we choose to do. Using our gifts in church and sharing our financial giving with the church is who we are, not just another charity that we give to as wonderful as charities are. Serving is who we are. Forgiving is who we are. Not another thing we choose to do. You know, the church is called the body of Christ. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, The church is the way the risen Christ has chosen to be present to the world. If that's true, it makes sense that we're the body of Christ. The church is the way the risen Christ has chosen to be present to the world. And that's why it's so important that we make Paul's joy complete. That we love one another and not fight and fuss and mistrust each other. And when we do these things, when we do fight and fuss and mistrust each other because we're human... That's not the end of the world. We have tools for that as Christians. We can recognize. We can repent. We can forgive. Our task is too important. And the time is too short. By God's grace, Glenmar, our cup runneth over. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? God has poured and poured and poured into us. I'm so thankful for the ways that we pour ourselves into others as Paul put it if there is any comfort in Christ any consolation from love any partnership in the spirit any tender affection and sympathy make my joy complete be of the same mind having the same love being in full accord and of one mind do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we respond to the word read and proclaimed, I can think of no better way to respond to a God that has given so much, that pours out God's grace and love and mercy. I can think of no better way to respond to that God than with generosity ourselves. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. God is a giver, a generous giver. And so we who are called to imitate Christ are called to give also. Um, Because of your giving, we can be the body of Christ together. And I see it every day. And so, however you choose to give, whether in person or online, um, I'm grateful. And the outpouring from you is blessing others in the church, in the neighborhood, and around the world. Let us pray for the offering we're about to receive. Gracious God, I give you thanks 
for the ways that you pour your grace and your love and your mercy out into the world. And I thank you that you have given us eyes to see that the source of your hope and love and mercy, his name is Jesus. And God, as we pour out, as we give our gifts in response to your great, great love, sometimes we pour out and we, um, we give our gifts and we, we water the plants, God, of, of what you send us to care for. And we may not see the outcome of that pouring. But we know if we are faithful, you will give growth in your time. And so bless this offering and the gifts of your people. Bless the faith and commitments that lay behind that gift. Bless God our love reflected in these gifts and offerings. It's a reflection of the love that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please join me in the closing prayer. Merciful God, oh, I'm sorry. I guess you, you can't join me. Let's bow together and say, <laughs> have the closing prayer. Merciful God, give us the same attitude as Jesus, an attitude and posture of humility, who emptied himself and was obedient to you all the way to his death on the cross. Make us eager to put others before ourselves and their needs before our own. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we go forth in the name of Christ, I wanted to lift up just a few spotlight ministries um, for this week. I wanted to remind you that um, this Saturday uh, we will have our sixth annual Jewels for Hope sale. That Saturday, November 5th, it's from 8.30 to 2. 100% of the proceeds will benefit Hope Works, which is Howard County's Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Center. HopeWorks helps their clients with legal, medical, law enforcement, financial, and any emergency needs to get them back on a stable and safe footing. And as uh, in many areas of our world, the needs of their clients have escalated um, as the violence after COVID um, has become more intense. And so you can support their mission by making the sale a success, by attending with your friends and neighbors, or making a cash donation to HopeWorks. And if you have questions, um, there's a table in the gathering place that can answer any questions you may have. This is a great way to get started on your Christmas shopping, folks. Um, the, the, the inventory that they have is amazing. And this is also a way to give a present to Jesus, the birthday boy. Right? That I'm buying a present that then I will give to my family, but I'm also giving a gift 
to people who need hope and healing in Jesus' name. Sounds like a perfect thing for the body of Christ to be doing. The next thing is that Christmas is coming. I know that's hard to wrap your head around. Um, Family Christmas Eve needs you. We're looking for children and youth and young adults who want to be a part of the Family Christmas Eve uh, skit and worship experience. And we're doing some of it pre-recorded. So if you don't like to be live in front of people, we got something for you. We've got speaking and non-speaking roles. Contact Pastor Milena or Julie Matakis for more information. And next Sunday will be All Saints Sunday at Glenmar Church. And uh, at both the 9.30 and the 11 a.m. service. And we want to invite you to submit pictures and names of the saints. Um, family, friends, neighbors, community members in your life who have passed from labor to reward over the past year so that we can just give thanks for their life and come together in thanksgiving and worship for the gift of these saints. And we need pictures and names to us by Wednesday, November 2nd. Um, You can send it to worship at glenmarumc.org or any pastor that you know the name of because we will take it all in. Um, That is what I have today. Um, And so what remains is to go forth from worship into service. And so go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace to love and serve your neighbor. I pray that this worship experience has filled you up. Yes, has given you a sense of God's love and provision for you so that you may go forth from this place and share that with others. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.